Now, we can kick off proceedings with uh, one question from uh, out of town. Uh, Brian, I'll throw it to you to hear what you know. Um, first question is, is the Newman government going to cut back on the Screen Queensland budget given the cutbacks on the literary awards? And is that going to be at our expense? Well, I'll just throw a quick um, response there. Uh, we obviously don't know um, what the government's thinking about its budget. It has said that uh, nothing's ruled out and, and, and nothing's ruled in. Um, I think part of the answer lays in that question itself uh, about the cutbacks on the literary awards. We all saw what a bashing the government got from the literary community. Uh, and I would say that it is very much uh, our role and my role to remind the Premier and the Arts Minister of that um, when they are considering uh, uh, our allocation. Uh, I will say, as Brian said in his opening remarks, that we do have both the Premier and particularly a Minister who are particularly supportive of the arts. So that gives us some optimism. All right, if I could ask the first question over there. Hello, my name's Mark Over from New Holland Pictures, and I'm going to start, I've got a whole bunch of questions, but I'll start with two very quick ones for Michael, please. Michael, in your opening address, you brought up the notion of producers talking more to exhibitors. Just want to know if you have any thoughts about how that bridge we built. I remember if AIMC used to have an Australia night, which got cancelled. So I just wonder if there's any thoughts for the AIMC to reintroduce it. And secondly, if you could just let me know, is the board meeting still happening in June? Do with the first one. Oh, the second question first. It's definitely happening on June 21, I think. Is that it slipped meeting? off the website for a while, so I just wanted to double check. Oh, did it? Apologise that. No, definitely happening on June 21. Oh, look, it did slip off the website because of the uh, time constraints we had with the Minister. We have to have this documentation in place by the 26th, and we have to obviously approve it beforehand. So our meeting was set for the 28th. We had to bring it forward to the 24th. Monday the 24th. Monday the 24th. Monday the 24th. To answer your first question, um, uh, it, look, the, uh, I need to be very careful because I want to speak with conflict. Um, the AIMC, I think, is always a tremendous event for all three arms of the industry to come together and talk. Uh, the Australian night hasn't dropped off the agenda. It has been and will be on Sunday night. Um, I will say this year, though, that unless we have a particularly good Australian movie, we will not show an Australian movie. We'll show the best... Um, premiere available. Uh, Monday night has always been the Independence Night, uh, so has all the independent distributors in the room. And of course, the major distributors are there all week. So um, I think, um, as best I can, not wanting to be in conflict, say that the AIMC, I think, is an excellent opportunity for you as producers to be consulting distributors uh, in an informal, relaxed environment. Um, and at the same time, you're seeing what is relevant. I thought Brian summed that up very well. Great, thank you. Could, could I? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add to that. I mean, I think um, you know the, the movie convention, absolutely without any conflict, I can say is uh, just the best event for anyone who uh, you know wants to really uh, pitch a film or get a feeling of what distributors are looking for, what you're up against. Um, you know, it, it's really really hard to get a meeting with a distributor. You know, the movie convention we have just down the road. Um, all the distributors are there, they're letting the hair down, they're drinking in the evening at the bars in, with great relaxation, chatting to anybody and everybody. Um, it's really, really hard to get a meeting with any other time of year. It's a terrific opportunity, not necessarily to give them the script, but certainly to kind of, you know, press the flesh and just get a bit of an idea and maybe introduce yourself or your project just without boring them too much. And certainly, um, you know, that, that really led to the Screen Producers Association back in, um, I think it was 2001 or so, um, moving the convention right next to the, um, the, the SPA conference next to the uh, movie convention. So it uh, really does deliver terrific value if you're in the film business, in my judgment. And it's really great opportunity for South East Queensland to get there very easily. So. And I'll just say we have moved into October this year to enable uh, the distributors to bring the very latest content. Um, well, August has always been a bit of a dead period. Um, moving into October allows the distributors to bring what we hope is a Christmas content from, uh, from the States. Any other questions? Come on, folks, we've got an hour to fill. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell, I've got heaps. Um, Brian, the Production Incentive Program, you mentioned in partnership with producers as do, uh, is that, do you mean that literally? That interstate producers will have to 
partner with local producers? Uh, it, re it really depends. Um, just let me look at what the wording... <coughs> with, with an incentive, uh, there's no one-size-fits-all, obviously. Um, I mean, I think a, the, the, the issue there is the fact that we would rather interstate producers come in and work with, you know, um, local producers where appropriate. But that'd be terrific if we could make that happen. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not a one-size-fits-all, and clearly I don't have the power to mandate interstate producers to do that. But I think that's where we're coming from. I mean, we, we're not going to give out unlimited incentives, clearly, to interstate companies that kind of come in, take the money, and leave. Can I just ask why? Why couldn't you? Why couldn't you dictate in the rules that they have to employ a Queensland producer? Well, I think when I say we can't dictate, to a certain degree, it's a question. I think it's a question of degree, Mark. I think, you know, it's case by case, and how it depends on how much we're giving and what the moving parts of the deal are. I mean, if we feel we're, if we're doing a, uh, a project that is based in Surface Paradise and it's about, you know, Surface Paradise, then we're in a pretty strong position to negotiate. If it's really location agnostic, then we're not in as powerful a negotiating position, for example. So sometimes we'll have negotiating power, and sometimes we won't. But I mean, we would seek to, we want to try and, you know, as we've been saying, uh, network local producers with interstate producers. And sometimes, if we're giving a substantial incentive, we would say, you've got to work with uh, a local producer if that's appropriate. It's like when we give out a, a, an incentive to um, a studio, to a Hollywood studio. There are very strict conditions on uh, jobs, you know, and on the number of Queenslanders that are employed. So it's not like we'll bring all your crew from interstate and, um, you know, it'll be right, fine, we'll just give you X amount and that's fine. We make it a condition. So, yeah, your point's well taken, but I, I'm just saying it's not one size fits all, that's all. Okay, cool. Yeah. I've got one here from uh, online. Roman, I am a Queensland producer and want to set up business with an interstate producer. Can I apply for the Enterprise Program? Oh, uh, yeah, it does follow on, yeah. Uh, yeah, the answer is yes, uh, you could. Uh, so we would recognise, I mean, it's a little bit like, say, Wild Fury, who have an office in Sydney, an office in, in, um, in Brisbane. So um, it makes a lot of sense sometimes to, for business purposes, to team with a southern state producer where the deals are done maybe more in Sydney and Melbourne. Again, I'm not recommending that, I'm just saying that's covered. And uh, yeah, we would certainly um, be very open to that and would, would encourage it. Anything that really, I guess where we're coming from is we're all about trying to get quality projects in front of decision makers. So to that extent, that would fit the scheme. Yeah. Hi, uh, Dean Waring from Shadow Shifters. We operate in the game production uh, area. Lately. We're starting to brand new enterprise. I was interested to see the uh, level of support on the multi-platform and games uh, page here, yeah. um, sort of with a figure of up to $40,000, uh, depending on uh, monetization plans, etc. And uh, in our own particular case, we sort of took particular care to make sure that we had global distribution uh, before we actually thought about <coughs> developing the game. So we started with concept and then definitely went straight to uh, distribution deals with, uh, with major players in, in that field. So the monetization plans often support a, um, a much better return uh, than one might expect. How the budgets to produce a, uh, a compelling game within that space may be around the 200,000 figure. The returns um, can be substantially higher within a very short period of time if you're looking at a global market. So I was interested to see uh, the, you know, what process may have actually led you to decide on a cap of 40,000, uh, which is probably not going to spur the production of a game with international viability. Thanks, Dean. Um, you, that 200,000 figure, can you just clarify roughly what that, what, what that figure relates to? So we're talking about uh, the basic costs of a team of, say, half a dozen people uh, for about a year of production. Yeah. And Direct so cost. All right, so you're saying that if we put in 40,000, um, I mean, it, it, would that be, the, that be the total budget for that particular game in that example? Is that what you're saying? The 200,000? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, yes. You can produce a, a, um, a good marketable product yeah. around that figure in Australia with a small team. Look, it, it, 
the basis of to, to honestly answer your question, the basis of the forty thousand is uh, is is not as expert as we'd like it to be. I mean, we're on a learning curve here, uh, and obviously, games come in all budget levels. I mean, games. And I thought you were going to say we're working on a game for three million bucks. <laughs> Thanks for the forty k. You know, um, so I'm relieved you didn't say that. But um, I think that that. In that example, forty thousand might be twenty-five. You know, if it's twenty, if it's twenty percent of the budget, that's quite respectable. If it was then put together with some money from Screen Australia, for example, and obviously I'm not. It depends on the structure of the game as to how much money. I don't know how much money you can get from the marketplace. Obviously, games can be fully funded by international games companies or not. Uh, the interesting distinction, I suppose, between um, you know other screen production uh, deals is yeah. that uh, the major distributors do not. Um, invest in the project at all. They'll take a 30% cut off the top for distribution, okay. but they have online digital distribution to you know, 55 up to 200 million uh, customers. So uh, instead of actually investing in production in any way, they don't. They wait yeah. until you're ready to launch your project, and then they'll market it, or what should I say, distribute it online through their uh, platform and take 30% off the top. So there isn't any industry funding, yeah. so to speak. Look, you know what, I, I think we're always uh, open, I mean, we, we, I suppose technically uh, as bureaucrats we might be able to twist the rules a little bit and say we maybe, we have a, if there's an exceptional project offered with an exceptional marketing plan, then as you would also have noticed that um, in the development and production investment programs proper, there is also coverage on multi-platform. So, um, you know, you could argue maybe there's a little bit of a double dip possible there. Um, I, I'd comment on that, and this is what this forum is designed to achieve, so um, you know, I appreciate the, the input, it's really helpful. Um, I think the other thing is I'm, I am absolutely aware that the returns can be much higher and the, kind of, you know, the hit rate uh, you know, can be quite different if you've got a significant distribution arrangement with a, a, a major games company. And um, you know, we all dream of a GTA by City or whatever franchise, that'd be nice. I don't think you need any public money for that, but anyway. Um, no, not after the first week. Yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. The, um, so I, I think the other thing that comes to mind there is um, the kind of the whole public-private thing and whether in some way public money can help a company such as yours kind of access private money or maybe we can help get you into private money. It, it, one of the things that we can do which is beyond the value of our dollars sometimes is give our imprimatur, you know, our brand to a project, and, and sometimes we might not put a huge chunk of money, and often it's you know less than ten percent across the board in a project. But people say, oh, okay, well, the government are in there, you know, we've got some money from Screen Queen, and that then triggers. No one wants to be the first to to put their hands up. So, you know, it's one of the values we bring. So maybe there's an element of that as well. But again, we'd always look Dean at any proposal, and and we we are trying. We mention figures because we kind of have to, to sort of mention orders of magnitude, and we're, we're always in a bit of a cleft stick. We had a lot more figures in this document and in some of our draft documents, but we knocked them out because we, I think we all believe that it's better to remain flexible and kind of look at it case by case. We obviously have to offer parameters because otherwise you say, well, we don't know what we're applying for here. This is ridiculous. So we have to kind of tread that middle line. So, but again, as with any project, if it, I think one of the things I'd like to believe we'd be better up than other states is, is uh, being a little bit open-minded and if you come to us and say, listen, I know it's what your program says, but here are the moving parts of this deal, what do you think? Then hopefully we'd be uh, open to that sort of dialogue. That's exactly the answer yeah. I would have loved, okay. yeah, loved to hear. <laughs> All right. Basically, it's, uh, yes, yeah. if your business plan is uh, yeah, it's a, business a little plan out of the ordinary in terms yeah. of scale, uh, then that may be reflected in your response. I think games is one of those areas where, uh, as I was saying earlier, is that if we can demonstrate a revenue return, then, you know, we, Screen Queens, are going to be heroes in the government, and they're going to say, hey, you guys are really doing real investment deals in the marketplace. There could be no better thing for public funding nationally than governments, federal and state, having a view that they're getting return on their dollars, because the reason they're not putting more money in overall is because they're thinking, yeah, we put all this money in and it disappears, you know. What sort of a deal is that? It's just a kind of a, you know. Um, so I think uh, anywhere, games is one of those areas, and I think you're pushing it a bit of an open door there. I think you could really make us all, make the public funding bodies heroes, perhaps. I don't know, both federally and, and state. That's the goal. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. The uh, value of the imprimatur that uh, Brian is talking about, the screen coins and imprimatur to a project, you see the financing uh, plans for many movies and you'll have 10 different sources of finance all dependent on something. 
quite often it's one of us jumping in first. Uh, so one should never underestimate the value of that screen Queensland imprimatur to a financing plan. But I also say that that carries great responsibility on screen Queensland as well. And I do expect our production team there to be uh, uh, quite ruthless in, uh, in, in deciding to uh, whether we should uh, give that imprimatur. Uh, as I said, it, it carries great responsibility to those nine or ten financiers behind us who jump in on the basis of, of our decision. Trish. Yes, hi everyone, Trish Lake. Um, the flexibility um, that you're talking about is very much welcomed, I think, by all of us. And, um, you know, I'm hearing a lot of excitement and optimism, and I think that's a good thing for all of us. We've gone through a tough time the last few years, everybody in this industry, and I know you understand that. And, yeah, so great that we're here today and, and it really, I think, is being received well, the information you're giving us. Um, a couple of things. Um, first of all, Michael, with AMIC, AIMC, it would be great for us to be considering whether SPA, the conference, could make another um, visit back to Queensland sometime in the next uh, year or two. And I know that's probably in your minds, but as a you know former and certainly a very committed current member of uh, former president of SPA, I'd very much like to see uh, us having that um, local dialogue where people come to us um, and experience how, especially Jenny if you're around as well, to uh, put on that sort of an event yeah. and have um, the buzz that I think we really had for those couple of years when SPA conference was being held in Queensland, so that would be something to put on the note. Um, the, uh, I guess the main thing I wanted to ask about was, um, I suppose, editorial independence in terms of, um, you know, how we very much over the last few years as producers in this state um, understood how Screen Queensland wants to see uh, producers locally um, thrive and that does require us to uh, be partners with you. And so the micro movies, which um, sounds very exciting, I would like to understand what the process would be in terms of editorial independence for the production companies that would be involved given the sort of, I suppose it seems like a bit of a micromanagement from where to go. I understand why that would be the case, it's um, kind of talent escalating. On the other hand, I want to see us as producers um, maintain our integrity in terms of editorial independence. So somebody from the floor might want to kind of let me know about that. Yeah, I'd be happy to comment on that. Um, look, uh, I think editorial independence, it's going to operate like, um, you know, any commercial filmmaking uh, production process continues. So, I mean, obviously, the way um, a film is funded and the way it's controlled and the way it's shaped, you know, before it goes into production is uh, by all the parties involved. And it's, it's a collaborative process. Uh, there are disagreements. Um, there is hopefully final consensus. Sometimes people are unhappy with that. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it certainly won't be. I mean, obviously, it is a process where we're saying. I mean, let's not. We, we can't back away from the fact that public funding bodies choose projects. I mean, it, that's the way it works. I, mean, I, I think anybody who's giving out money picks projects and says, "I'm going to go with this team as opposed to that team." To pretend that there's some objective measure is is ingenuous. I mean, clearly certain things are favoured, there is always less money around than there are projects. So there is a selection process which will, well, produ the producers no, I'm will... Not, I, I'm, I'm yeah. simply, yeah. I guess, there was a time mm. when um, there was some controversy. You know, I, I think it would be early last decade, in the very early 2000s, it would have been the yeah. late um, 1990s, when Screen Queensland, what, which was then PFTC, um, took on the man mantle of being an executive producer and essentially was, you know, operating in a much more hands-on way in terms of content. And I just wondered whether with the uh, low budget, or well, essentially these micro movies, yeah. whether that was the intention 
you know, I'm assuming not, but I just wanted to kind of make a point about that. Totally get that the selection process with everything, it's always competitive. You guys clearly would be the major sole investor in this case, aside from the offset. But just a scenario where um, I'd like to understand that it's still pretty much um, as every other um, funding arrangement operates currently with Screen Queensland. This is something I'm assuming that would be the norm as opposed to something new in terms yeah. of the editorial independence. Thanks, Trish. Yeah. Look, it, it's hard for me to be really clear, but I know there is real concern about that kind of thing. You know, Screen Queens wants to be an exec producer, or even worse, a producer. Um, that isn't the case, but at the same time, you know, in the, through the development process, obviously there's a process of feedback with expert input. Uh, in, in, in the case of the micro budget program, uh, it's possible that the, maybe even likely, that the winning, you know, project will be uh, relatively inexperienced. So to be able to draw on some of the production, the physical production experience, we'd have to make sure that the physical line production was being managed by someone of your experience, for example, uh, so that uh, you know the money wasn't just the person might be very bright creatively, but just has never really managed uh, an, an operation of physically making a film. But in terms of the uh, you know the editorial independence, well, it would be true to the script that was developed in the usual ways the scripts are. And then the, the, the producer would have independence. And we are, at the end of the day, trying to recruit new talent. So we hardly want to say, well, you know, we, as Screen Queens, are no better than the, the new talent who's come out of this competitive process as to what the, um, the exact, you know, um, fine. It, sound, it sounds to me like it's going to be fine, but okay. that was just something that I wanted to Sorry. raise. I know there's, obviously, that, um, there's obviously some horror stories from the past which we'll have to share over a drink with it sometime. Um, I want to stay in the same topic area. Yeah. So with the micro budget, are we Queensland residents, is that for all heads of department? Is that all key creators? Um, you know, I haven't got down to that level of detail. I mean, I think probably at this event, at this uh, venue, it would be opportune for you to, if you have a recommendation, to say, I think it should be. And I, you know, we obviously wanted to make it to Queensland production, but this is not, uh, this is to get new talent. So we would like to use Queensland people right through where possible. I don't want to be absolute and then have someone say, hang on, there's one person who's from somewhere else. I mean, I think that's how it should be, wherever yeah. possible. Should absolutely, be where it absolutely should be, because it is a full funding uh, program. It is all about uh, emerging talent. And uh, I think in principle, yes, you know, never say never, but in principle, absolutely. Presumably, though, if it's all emerging talent, there will be at least a mentor or an experienced production yes. executive involved. Yes, most definitely. And I mean, uh, yeah, we have to balance that against Trish concern, Trish's concerns that, yeah, we would supervise. And obviously, a lot of people who are very expert in production in, in Screen Queensland, uh, and obviously in the script process, we have some of the, you know, terrific expertise in script. So, there will be supervision of, of, in, through development, through production, and in the actual production, we'd make sure that there was an expert, as it were, a line producer, who, you know, was keeping us across what was going on, so. Yeah. And just staying in that area, on that $600,000 budget, yeah. um, and Alan Harris, I apologise if I'm just rounding things up, if we're assuming uh, 240000 is with the offset, the, uh, is, is the offset, and 360 is coming from Screen Queensland. Is the 240,000 being cash flowed by Screen Queensland? Uh, yeah, the rest is an investment. So Correct. 360 is an investment, and then you cash flow the, the offset. Correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's fine. I'm just um, it's on fine. this micro budget thing. It's yeah. a fine line. It's a very fine line as to whether. Based on the five hundred fifty thousand dollars minimum uh, spend, mm -hmm. you would even qualify for the forty percent offset. Um, yeah, I think I my arithmetic time. may have been a bit sloppy there, but I think I may have rounded it. But you've oh, got. <laughs> <laughs> I think you may have me on that one. I think they, I think you're probably right. I think it's probably closer to six, isn't it? Oh, it's a five seven. Yeah, I think pushing it from between six and seven hundred thousand mm -hmm. to feel like even just to deal with the units. I mean, that's the other. Is, well, just in ca cast it. Well, I guess yeah. The other problem with the six hundred thousand dollar budget is um, when it comes to distribution and the fact that people don't <coughs> see a new star, and all of a sudden you have that implication of bringing somebody in from overseas, which is obviously cutting your quote down. I mean, hitting your forty percent could be 
the, the, the problem with low budget films is that you, you can't afford the cast unless you know somebody and yeah, someone's going to do you a favor. A Sorry? I mean, the whole idea is to start making these movies for a market. Yeah, but I think the micro budget film program is really kind of uh, is the exception that proves the rule a little bit in terms of my international perspective. I think the film uh, has, you know, I think this is a film that isn't going to be made with big cats, one assumes, unless, as a producer, the producer is able to pull in a favor. So I think it's a film that it can't be pre sold you can't pre-sell a $600,000 film. I mean, because you can't have, you're not going to nail the cast unless, as I say, you know somebody. But in um, any case, you're still going to have plenty of things that aren't going to be quakeable, so you're still going to still struggle to hit them. I, I hear you. Yeah. I hear you that the, the, the quake population is probably a bit sloppy on our part. Uh, but I, I think it's going to be in that sort of region. Uh, I, I accept the fact you've got, I mean, you can't make a, you, this is an entry level program. The alternative is we say, and maybe this is a, another way to go, you say, well, then we run into problems with the unions is we say we should be making movies at one, two hundred thousand dollars, you know, and, and giving to sort of it's somewhere between your sort of student film and your commercial film. You know, is is that a better scheme? I don't know whether anybody has a view here. The problem then is you run into, and Lynn, you're much more expert on this than I am, and Trish too, and Mark, is we do run into union problems as to, you know, we're making a non, is that a non union film? Are we a screen Queensland endorsing a non union film? I'm not to book. I'm not sufficiently expert to know what the, the, the issues are there. I mean, there might be a, an argument for saying, well, if you really want to get new talent, maybe you're better making films for one, two hundred thousand dollars, but then you don't get the 40%. So you think, gee, if I get to that level and I get whatever it is, 250K from uh, the offset, you suddenly jump into another league, which is the logic of our arithmetic. Um, what do you think? I don't know. Um, I have one other question, if you don't mind. Uh, under the production investment section, where you're saying that um, for investments over 100,000, there will be a requirement to have an attachment or attachments. Yes. Um, for a while there, there was a stipulation as to what departments or who those attachments would have to be. Mm -hmm. And I know from offshore production experience that got to be a fairly contentious issue when we mm -hmm. were being told we had to have a first assistant cameraman or something like that, specifically from Queensland. I mean, they were actually putting labels on the departments we could choose from for the attachments. Have you guys thought any more about that and whether or not that's going to be what you're going to stipulate when it comes to these attachments? Um, I'll just, uh, mm -hmm. Rosie, if you can just perhaps, uh, I'm going to pass the, the mic to perhaps Gina on this uh, as well. It's just Look, I'll just say generally that, to be honest, we haven't worked out. I was not aware of contentious issues surround Rocky, obviously, as well, Gina and Rocky, if you can comment on that. Uh, I, I'm not aware of the fine detail of problems that there have been on production attachments, and if there are contentious issues, then we really, I mean, to state the obvious, we kind of need to work through them and figure out what, what is going to be broadly acceptable to everybody. We don't want to impose something that everybody's really annoyed about. So I'm giving Rocky and Gina a bit of a preamble to kind of uh, comment further. But we'd really appreciate your, if you've got specific ideas, you know, offline to give them and say, look, this, this is going to be acceptable, that we're just going to make ourselves unpopular and it's not going to work. That's what this process is all about, you know. Yeah, we've been down that track with a few yeah. larger budget films. Yeah. No, we'd really appreciate your advice on that, then, and thoughts. Yeah, and Rocky, do you want to comment further on that? Yeah, just given, Lynn, good morning. Um, the, Historical perspective on that is probably best handled by Matt, who's been in the Screen Queensland, and then I'll take the microphone from there as soon as she's giving you the historical things. Hi, Lynn. Um, yeah, we didn't place any stipulations, and we wouldn't want to. We really want the producer or the practitioner to either approach you guys or vice versa, because we <coughs> want to find those people that need to be developed in the state. So we really want it to be in partnership. And that's, that's the way we're going to be carrying on with it, Lynn. Is that good? Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, anybody got any other thoughts on that micro-budget budget level? I mean, it, 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 is, it was a real brain teaser, you know? I mean, anybody want to shout out, or there's a roving mic if anybody wants to get, put their hands up if they've got a thought or comment, uh, doesn't want to stand on the microphone, um, it can certainly comment on that. Uh, 
Because it is, it is a dilemma. I mean, how, what, what's a low budget movie? Is it, you know, is it a credit card movie for 50 grand? Is it a half million? Is it 1.5? I mean, it, it, you know, it's kind of all of the above. And, and what we've got to try and figure out is how do we get most bang for our buck, you know, in that, in that idea, given our underlying objectives. But we're really open to you guys saying, you know, it should be something else, or what about this, or have we thought about that? Brian, what's your main objective? Is it to give new people a foot into the industry, or are you just trying to make some films that you know aren't going to make any money? We're, we're trying to give people... <laughs> Sorry, just stand the obvious. <laughs> we're, you know what, we're trying to give people a way into the industry. Okay, and well, what about a cadetship program that's subsidised? So if you have a, an up-and-going marketplace program film in production, Screen Queensland can you know, throw cadetships at uh, existing productions. For example, we're taking three on ours. Well, well the, big for thought. the no, no, that's a great idea, Linda. Thank you. I think the cadetships, you know, I kind of like uh, the what we call an attachment program. So uh, another name for an attachment program. But I think the uh, the proposition. I don't fully accept the proposition that, and Linda's going to reference because she can't argue with me now. But <laughs> she'll just shout. But. Uh, I don't fully accept the proposition that you can't make a $600,000 film that's successful. I mean, you know, some of Australia's most successful films have been made in that sort of bracket. I mean, um, what's it? The, the, the Castle was rumoured to be, depending on who you believe, whether you believe Working Dog, was, was between three, four hundred thousand bucks. It was shot multi camera like TV from their frontline experience. I mean, I don't think Kenny, Kenny wasn't a King's Ransom. Um, was it about a million yet? Yeah. Uh, I, I think the interesting thing, I, I think the problem is there's this kind of dichotomy. You've, you've got to really uh, distinguish between if you're going to make a film that, that is going to be a pre-saleable film, then you've really got to play the game, which I think is, is the game you're alluding to, of, of uh, getting out there into the market. And what I've been talking about at the lectern, but there's another model, you know, it isn't one size fits all. You, if you can make a really, really uh, a cracking little film, Let's pick another one, Love and Other Catastrophes. I mean, I don't know why Australia doesn't make more chick flicks. I mean, maybe we can have a you know, discussion about that. It's crazy to me that we don't make more romantic comedies in a physically you know, beautiful place like Australia, you know, leveraging our incredible locations, which, which are stars in their own right in the international marketplace. Um, you know, the, so there are movies like that that can be made. Uh, other examples, like in the US, Brothers McGregor, Ed Burns made, Ed Burns made this film. Um, it was his first film, and he went on to make loads of films and become an actor in his own right, which he kind of was the auteur. You know, things like The Gods Must Be Crazy. You can, if you're a real talent, that's the sort of films, I mean, it's a very ambitious thing, but I, I really believe there's a lot of talent out there. I believe why, my, my whole philosophy is, is that, you know, uh, don't put your daughter on the stage because it's so cruel. You look at the talent shows every night and they're just brimming with talent. And it, it, I haven't worked in the business, as I'm sure we all have for so long, we see how unfair it is. I, the, the scheme is really recognizing that and saying, let's go and buy this process, this competitive process, go and get something which is an absolutely cracking idea in the first instance. Because in my judgment as a distributor of many years, I've distributed thousands of film and TV programs, is that often, you know, it's a great film, but it's not marketable. The theme isn't what, what, the, what they're buying this season. They're not, they're not buying white flare trousers this season. I'm sorry, you know. You, so you, you've got to kind of read the zeitgeist and get what out, what's out there. A lot of, I think it is looking for new talent. I think, to some extent, and I don't want to be ageist about this, maybe it's a little bit generational. I, I, and again, an exception always proves the rule. But, you know, I see my teenagers, you know, who are the primary movie market, and I think, Gee, you know, they're saying they know exactly what kids want to watch. And I often get into discussions about, um, you know, filmmaking, and I feel like, gee, you know, I should bring my kids along. They've got a much better idea about what's marketable here, which is a, a stupid suggestion. You obviously can't bring teenagers into a film business meeting. I've been drummed out of the Queensland government. But the point is, is that, um, you know, that's what I'm trying to tap in, the, in this scheme. That's what we're trying to tap in this scheme, is trying to say, look, you can make a low-budget film if you've got your finger on the pulse. You don't have to have a squillion dollars. There's a million examples of that, really, around the world, not just in Australia. So I don't accept that low-budget films don't make money. Uh, can, can I, can I, I add offer to that a, as well? Sorry. Uh, sorry, I'll just offer one comment there. The fastest-growing segment for demographic moviegoers are the over-50s. 
Well, there you go. So maybe it's what's the movie? The uh, final, um, well, the, the one with. Uh, well, you see lots of marigolds. Yeah. The marigolds and the other one, the one with better comedy, the other one. Uh, the Quartet. Quartet. I'm sorry. Let's go, this, let's go to this side. We haven't had a question for that microphone yet. <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah. That was, oh, that was related. I just, just want to add something with that this is whole micro too. budget thing is that it's about creating content creators as well. Whereas if you've got the, you know, someone going on and going as an attachment, sure you get great experience, but you don't have that experience as a content creator and as a producer. Whereas in the kind of five hundred to six hundred thousand dollar film area, you're in control to an extent with Screen Queensland behind you, but you've also got this kind of the buck stops with you, which you don't get when you're kind of being attached to other productions and that kind of thing. So I just wanted to say that's why I think it's better than you know, the other thing was suggested as well. Thanks. Thanks. I'll take the next three. I'll take the next three questions from this side. So, so, um, Alex Barnes. Um, I've got a, yeah, a bit of a point to add because the micro budget. I wonder if you'd consider, say, a telly movie. I know that that sort of cuts out a bit of the theatrical here in you know, Australia at least, but. Um, you know, Matchbox have just done Julian Assange, and that's kind of done, they've done a separate theatrical over in the US for that. And I think they're sort of the ones that do quite well on you know, TV, and I know that's a whole other um, collaboration, but uh, you know, they get quite good numbers, and um, I was wondering if that's something you consider right. as well. Well, uh, I'm glad you raised that. <laughs> um, the, 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 I've got a sort of a, a negative answer and a positive answer to that question, if I may, in that observation. Thanks, Alex. Is the first thing the problem with a telly movie is? Yeah, I'd love to consider a telly movie if you've got one hundred and twenty thousand dollars extra in your back pocket, eh, because that that wipes the the offset from forty down to twenty percent. That's point number one. That's kind of the bad news. The good news is when I saw that Julian Assange telly movie, which I thought was superb and and. Uh, you know, arguably could have been even better, uh, but I was terrific, and I thought it absolutely had its finger on the pulse of, uh, it, it, it's a, a really good example of what a micro-budget movie could have been. And I, my new media action as a distributor was, that should be a theatrical film. I mean, I think it was far more theatrically marketable than 90% of Australian films. So I think kind of in a way, I'm kind of in a strange way agreeing with you, but not, you know, in that sense. But I, I don't know why they probably, often what happens in, in uh, with say HBO uh, and Showtime historically in the States is when you do a telemovie deal over there, they'll give you a clause which allows you to go theatrical, this is in the States, and it really acknowledges the logic of your question. It says, well, if, you know, we're going to fund this film, uh, this telemovie in the US, but if it's a real cracker, then we're going to give you, under defined terms in the contract, the ability to release it theatrically because they think, well, you know, gee, that's going to promote going to make the, the property higher profile, or it might be the producer saying, well, I want that clause, and the party's agreeing. So I think it acknowledges the fact that some of the best drama, ob obviously, self-evidently around the world, is being made for television right now, and uh, I, I think there are some, it's a tragedy not to include uh, groups like Matchbox and Screen Time and other, you know, blue chip uh, drama producers in uh, the theatrical world. I mean, the only reason they're not in it is because it's too hard and they don't think they're going to make any money out of it, you know. Brian, I think that 40% was, um, and we'd have to check with Robert for certain about this, but I think he did a deal, which could be a deal for the model that you're talking about, where it was a 40% deal, the intent was there, they had a uh, theatrical oh, right. um, deal with exhibitors as well, yeah. but they had a window arrangement where TV got to go first. So essentially it was a telling movie that was able to get the 40% mm. offset because it always had a, was going to have a theatrical love. As I understand it, there's nothing in the legislation that says it can't go TV first as long as it's definitely going to go theatrical or the intent is there. I think it had a myth coming out as well. I'm not sure. But anyway, it was financed from what I understand with 30%, not 20%. I, I think only a TV person could have struck it down. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is the most ridiculous deal I've ever heard. If it goes, I mean, if it goes, on, if it goes on TV first, it doesn't go theatrically. Exactly, end of story. That's the model. I and mean, we can talk about Windows all day, but that's certainly one window. It has gone theatrically, and it raised the budget, and they got the 40%, and yeah. more Australians have probably seen that combined television and theatrical. And it's one of those areas where we've got to be way more flexible, and. Michael, it's great that we've got your expertise because we need to be in that mindset of how exhibitors think, but also understanding that people aren't necessarily going to watch it first theatrically or, 
you know, it'll be as they want to watch it. And if we can leverage the offset that way and still satisfy you guys and get huge audiences, TV and theatrical, why wouldn't we be doing well, that? Well, I'll, I'll share with you a conversation we had in Las Vegas, which follows on from Alex's question. Um, obviously, we're paying a great deal of regard to the success of TV at the moment. You're looking at the homelands and the Game of Thrones and Newsroom and those sorts of shows. And the question is being asked, why aren't they theatrical first? Why aren't we doing the weekly cinematic release of a homeland and then going to TV? Exactly. So I just throw that out there. That's, that's certainly a conversation that's taking place at the moment. It's really interesting because, I mean, it, it, those of us not many old enough to remember, is we used to go to the cinema and you'd get your serialised short before the main feature, so, you know. There is another example, uh, Storm Service. Where's that voice? Where's that one? Where's that one? Where's that one? Where is it? Robert, Red, Robert Redford, uh, Sundance. Oh, you love it. You let you in. So, uh, no, Storm Service played theatrically. And, uh, you know, it was a docker, and yeah. uh, it's done 650 grand theatrically, so mm. I don't know whether they got their 40%. Are they doing that theatrically? That's an are they doing that theatrically in a cinematic sense, or are they doing it as alternate content? No, it, it has played theatrically. It did yeah. 650, yeah. and uh, it's out on, on tape, and, uh, you know, HBO. Yeah. I think Storm Surfers no, was 40% offset. It was done as a theatrical. Yeah. I think there's another really good example, which isn't Australian, but it, you've made me think, fellas, is, is the, um, and Jenny, my favourite, is the trip. Uh, the, the Rob Brydon and Steve Coogan yeah. go out on a Range Rover and mm. uh, uh, review restaurants. If you haven't, go online. It's really funny, believe me. And um, it, it, it's the two primarily British comedians, you know, uh, who aren't, you'd say, aren't that well known outside uh, the UK, but it was such a hit in the US as a series, they, they cut it into a movie and they released a movie in the US theatrically, which is like, you think, whoa, you know, that kind of breaks all the rules and it, and it was successful because, so that goes to Trisha's point that we do need to be flexible, but, but noting that, you know, exhibitors have a very tough business themselves, you know, and uh, if something's go, going out to uh, TV, you're going to have to present one hell of a good case. It's going to have to be something really extraordinary to go theatrical after TV. That's or you can go off peak theatrical. I'm just talking about getting a budget together of 40% yeah. where clearly you believe there is a theatrical market. It may not be the top box office market that you're after, Michael, but it may be something that will do an off peak, quite you know, high screen average to a specialist market. And that's the sort of thinking that I'm hoping you guys are embracing because we as producers have to. Uh, yeah, and it reminds me of something else, because I worked in video for years and, and used to argue with the um, TV guys here who never got into ancillary exploitation. They never started a video business with the exception of ABC. They never got into m leveraging brands and merchandising. I used to get them and say, listen, you know, um, I've done sort of Coronation Street videos in, in the UK and they were hugely successful. And I said, look, let's do, you know, in the early days, Home and Away and Neighbours videos or movies. And they looked at me as I was from another planet, which I was, it was called the Britain. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, that really goes to the point that, that I think anything goes. If you've got a property and a valuable brand and property, you're crazy. I mean, it's like Kath and Kim. I was talking about a Kath and Kim movie four years before they made the Kath and Kim movie. But, you know, the problem is, is that, you know, TV... Uh, uh, think in a particular way as well. So it's often it's not the funding body. You know, we, we think, gee, that would make a lot of sense, and we are aware of a lot of different deals around the place, but often, uh, you know, t I'm, not, I'm not knocking TV. I'm not, we work very collaboratively, but obviously they have the, the most money in this country as regards local content. They are the, the you know, they are the financially um, wealthy party. They wouldn't admit that, but that's a joke. Can I it's just offer a comment on the Archon Henry? Um, about the micro budget, I think it's an excellent proposal and I congratulate you on that, it's something that should be done. May I remind you that HBO is a subscriber service and I have done deals with HBO where they've had an accelerator in the contract which says that if the film goes theatrical, they will pay you more money. Yeah. And that has happened on a couple of Australian productions. Also, let us not forget BBC Films. Uh, who have made a number of films that have gone theatrical, although the intent originally was television. My Left Foot is one example. So uh, I think going free to air, massively internationally free to air, does cut out the possibility of uh, <coughs> theatrical. 
But if it's a, a limited service, um, it's not seen by that many people. And there are different markets around the world where you can exploit it in different ways. So I think there's a lot of potential for the micro <coughs> movie proposal. Thanks, Joe. I think there's certainly a lot of that, and just to write it to that, because it is such an important point, is that, you know, it, we, we'd obviously all love to see the networks, um, both, you know, free-to-air and, uh, and public, uh, putting money into movies. You know, the problem for them is that they don't feel they get bang for the buck. They don't get that serial viewing. You know, they, they don't get the viewers because it's just a, you know, one hit, uh, one exposure and it's gone. Whereas obviously if they spend money on a series, they get repeat viewing and it's a better business model for them. And that's accelerating that trend. So it is a bit of a problem that we don't have a TV outlet, either free, pay or public, who is kind of mandated to put money into feature films. It's, in a mind, a bit of a structural problem in the Australian industry that really is one of the reasons why, you know, the Aussie film business is not as successful as it should be. I'm still on that microphone because I've got to take two questions on this side. They've been at that microphone for half an hour. <laughs> right. Kerry. Uh, thanks, Kerry O'Rourke from Cubix. I uh, just wanted to comment on that previous question, I think the previous element of this question, which is maybe there's another kind of model where there's much lower budget. Now, I think the, the micro budget uh, project is fantastic, but there is uh, something inside that that I'd like to share with you. Um, over our time, we've developed and facilitated the production of two features on ridiculous budget levels of about 25 seed budgets of 25 grand each. The producers then raised another 25, so they're both made for 50. Both have received uh, cable and uh, DVD and PPV distribution in the States now. So there's a kind of a pathway that they've opened up by doing that. Now, I'm not suggesting that there's anything like that. That's the, that's the level that a film should be made at because it's punishing. But what would be useful for people to know is that we have an understanding with Mia, we're talking about the union issue, so that in our production contracts, we guarantee that the producers will keep track through their schedules of every person who worked on the project, all the work, the work they did in all the different roles. They commit to paying under award, sorry, not under award, on the award, uh, or on standard industry fees to all of those positions, and that becomes the key budget for the film. We've also tracked all the budgets for all the films we've ever made. And, you know, we know that all the shorts we make, for example, sit on around about an average 200 grand each, and yet they only receive very small amounts of seed funding from us. But we do that by following this MIA model, so the unions are comfortable with it. They understand it's developmental, and so they just relax about that, because there's a commitment. Thanks, Kerry. That's really interesting, because uh, obviously as soon as we go down in budget, we obviously run into uh, MIA problems, and something that I'm not as expert in as a lot of you guys are, and some of my colleagues are, obviously. And, uh, you know, it's something we really need to hone in on. But uh, it is a bit of a dilemma, I mean, and, um, you know, what, 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 what is the level? And uh, as I say, um, again, we welcome any further ideas on that by email or, or, or in this session. Brian, yeah. is that, uh, or Kerry, is that because you're an RTO? That no, no, it, take had that it was established well before we had RTO status. It's because we're a screen development centre and they understood what we were doing. Please. Uh, good morning. Um, it's good to see. I'm trying to break the stranglehold of the discussion about um, cinema releases. And, uh, let's talk about documentary. A lot of people here are documentary filmmakers. Probably the majority of them we haven't heard. Yeah. Um, an important thing that people who have contact with government should point out, it's not, especially in the area of documentary, especially in the area that I work in, a few other colleagues work in, which is natural history, travel and what have you, <coughs> pro projects that are placed in Queensland and feature Queensland, unlike say under 60, uh, Hill 60, which is in Flanders, are probably doing a lot of good tourism business in Flanders and so on. And in most feature films, don't feature Queensland. <coughs> the point I'm leading to is tourism. Uh, of course, Trisha's film is set in Harvey Bay. And, and in Springsteen Gold, Gold Coast. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. and, um, and Gold Coast, and it's clearly there. Um, it's not just the money that <coughs> these documentaries bring in or return. You've got to point out, uh, hopefully you will point out to the political masters, that say a film like 
the last natural history film which was set in Queensland that I produced was the one about marine turtles at uh, Monrupo Beach at Bundaberg. Now that's been seen by what, 200, 300, 400 million people around the world. There's no film being produced in Queensland or Australia that gets anything close to those figures. Although you can't actually point to the re financial return. It's something that does drive tourism to Queensland. And uh, as I mentioned to Brian the other day, I'm going back to feature films now, that uh, the original 60,000 60, Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne in the book, uh, Captain Nemo travels through the northern part of the Great Barrier Reef and through Torres Strait. Now there's a bit of leverage if you can get that mentioned. Uh, it, it, it actually has a reason to be shot in Queensland or parts of it rather than the Caribbean or somewhere else. So final point I'm making is it's a documentary that's set in Queensland that features Queensland that puts bums on airplane tickets, seats and brings them out and that should be quantified in some way. Thanks. It's a very relevant point. I'll, I'll, I'll suggest to you that you have <coughs> remarkable support at Baltimore. Yeah. Yeah. I think <laughs> what I'm saying is government strong. should know yeah. that it's, it's, the finances do come back in another way. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah it, it is, Larry. I, I agree. And at, at, at our level too, because I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, with my Pommy accent, I mean, I, you know, I still think I'm on holiday here after 30 years. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the place is so bloody beautiful. Obviously, yeah. the rest of the world in those cold, long winter nights, there is nothing more attractive in the world than Queensland, or yeah. Australia in general. And I mean, sometimes, you know, I, I with my Pommy heritage, and I still travel a lot, is I'm amazed at how we underestimate the appeal of that, you know, in terms of whether it be in, in factual programs, and come on to in a moment, or, or films, as I said a moment ago. So I agree with you. I think. Um, in terms of factual, yes, you're right, the, the skew of the conversation has, has been too much film. I mean, I went down to the uh, Adelaide Docker conference uh, a couple of months back, and look, I was absolutely blown away by the discussions that took place there, and, uh, you know, things like David Lyle, who, you know, is an Aussie who heads up Nat Geo globally. I mean, the, the proliferation and diversification and the, the explosion in factual content production globally is just mind-boggling. And I think the barriers to entry are, are coming down, you know, and I, I think that uh, there is a desperate need for product, there is ever more need for programming and just about Australia, it's about to, to respond to the point you made about the, the Turtle uh, project. Um, I'm not saying that specifically, but just generally, uh, factual entertainment is, uh, uns unscripted entertainment is, um, as well, which obviously blurs into traditional doco, um, is exploding, and I, I, I think the barriers to entry in that are much lower than traditional programming, and I think it offers Queensland a tremendous opportunity. You know, and examples of that would be, you know, I suppose people like Bar Fury or and, and many others yourselves, and with, with Norm and many other many others. Forgive me for not mentioning, but oh, he's um, in Africa most of the time. Is he? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he gets confused. <laughs> Can I just add to that too? Also, with the, the factual, it's going to be a big focus about presentations, and that's why we're working with Foxtel in their their factual and documentary uh, section, which covers A and E and, and crime and all of those uh, Foxtel owned channels. I mean, they're investing a lot of money in factual. So it's a, it, it'll be interesting to see what they yeah. with that presentation, which will be great. Yeah, I must say I have the strongest desire to see factual become commercial, and I'm hoping a movie like Lincoln might uh, tip people off. Yeah. I um, recently, or six months ago, went to Tourism Queensland, thinking that there could be some kind of organic or natural sympathy, and amounts like four hundred dollars were mentioned. You know, really high <laughs> amounts that they were tipping to. There's just no understanding at uh, the other government body, Tourism Queensland, that what a vital part that Queensland documentaries, especially in natural history, I mean, ones about uh, crime or something, certainly not going to drive people to Queensland, don't they? <laughs> I, I think that the Queensland ones that are set in Queensland show the beach and so on, uh, somebody's going to talk to those dodos over there and explain to them that, hey, here's a cheap way of getting good publicity, help them out. But they, um, I don't know who else has gone to tourism in Queensland. Yeah. 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 They, they, they welcome you with warm icicles. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, we, we, we're trying to uh, build bridges there and get dialogue going with Tourism Queensland. Uh, there was a, a project, which I won't mention there, but, but it was a, it was a, a sort of a, 
uh, unscripted entertainment project um, that, that could have come from Sydney into Queensland. And, and, I said, and I said, okay, well, if you can feature you know, some prominent Queensland locations in the show, then I'll go to Tourism Queensland and try and broker the deal. So precisely that. But I mean, there's no shortage of interest in, obviously, as you know, natural history and, and Australia as a place around the world, and just precisely the opposite. The problem often is, is getting that local piece, you know, that local interest, because we're so damn lucky with the surroundings here, we can't take it for granted and don't realise what, what an impact it has in those international markets. Sometimes, obviously, you guys do very much, but um, I mean, I totally agree with what you're saying. So uh, we are trying to broker those dialogues and explain the economic benefits. Brian, could I just add a comment very quickly? <clears throat> the greatest tourism and cultural promoter in the United Kingdom is Neighbours. Yeah. Ramsey Street, the real Ramsey Street, all the houses in the street are owned by Brits who came out and bought them, having watched the series. <laughs> it's true. Amazing. It's absolutely true. I've like, not home disappointed, I <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> right. Um, as a local producer and very keen to build a local scene, I think we would all recognise that we have world-class crews and world-class writers whose work we take on board. I would like Screen Queen's opinion about training of directors in this state, because at the moment there's probably only one or two that, if that, that in feature films would be bankable for us, and there is, we do need more directors to be based up here. And on a related note, what's Screen Queensland's position about the future of short film in the state? Okay, well, two uh, questions. Um, let me take the last one first. Um, is uh, short film, uh, I see the future of short film being tied to the market and the business. I have no um, duration agnostic. I mean, if the short film has a business plan, uh, then it's great. If it doesn't, then it's not part of the screen business, it's part of a training exercise. And that's a different discussion totally legitimate discussion, but a different one. We don't operate in training. Um, short films generally, obviously there has been a certain progression. I mean, short films in the old days were made because it was too expensive to make a long film, and film stock and film equipment was a lot more expensive than it is today. So to some degree, um, you know, the raison d'etre for short films has been uh, superseded by technological advance. Uh, but if a short film, as I mentioned, in relation to our interstitials, we acknowledge that there's now a bit of a backflip going on because new media could take in shorter formats. So that heralds perhaps a future for short film if they're geared to marketing and money. The, the monetization plan that I mentioned. So that would be my, if you wanted to, I don't know if you want to comment on the, on the short film question. But I'd, I'd be interested to see if anyone else has any thoughts about short film as a, yeah. as a venue by which we identify talent and, and uh, train our yeah, particularly oh, yeah, so it's really, you're tying it into talent. I think for talent, I think that um, the thing, thing is for uh, directors and, uh, you know, I've been, as we all have, you know, uh, some of us have in a lot of discussions locally and internationally on directors and just, you know, what's really interesting when you have discussions in bigger films in the States about, you know, I've been fortunate to get into some of those discussions is how, you know, our view of who's a really hot director is, is not necessarily their view, you know, they're, they're, it moves so fast that, that um, it's extraordinary, you know, the, the disrespect and how they recognise up and coming talent on the one hand and how quickly they diss a very distinguished director on the other hand is completely different to here where there is this kind of, you know, lifelong reverence for someone who's made a good film. It, it, it's not like that in, in Hollywood, quotes and quotes. I'll, I'll refer to Stephen Soderbergh's thing on that. He's, yeah. got, a, he's got quite an opinion. Okay. So well worth the read. Uh, the, the other thing is, what are we doing? The, the, the issue of nurturing directing talent is, is really complex and difficult, and clearly it is, for many people, the absolute pinnacle of the most glamorous, elusive business in the world, you know. So I don't, I'm not sure I have it in my remit to solve that one single handedly, but uh, I think that, um, you know. Look, take an example of, say, Robert Luketic. Uh, I mean, the guy was on, you know, the uh, Aussie Film Commission reception desk one day. He did his short film, or whatever it was, the, the in the car, the Datsun in a car, whatever it was. Uh, I was going to say that. That as well. And uh, there's another, yeah, I was going to mix it up with the other one. And uh, next minute, he's kind of directing Legally Blonde. Or was it Legally Blonde immediately? Was that the first one? It seems such a ridiculous transition. But I, I think that that goes to your point. Um, but having said that, uh, the what he said, the film was um, the was uh, I think a virtually nothing budget. 
So that kind of then, in a sense, counters your term because that really goes to the point, I think, that yes, money is great and needed, but sometimes, you know, talent will rise above a complete lack of money. So, um, I don't know, it's not really answer, answering the question. It, certainly we should talk to people like Kingston at the ADG about that, uh, you know, I think he's a really intelligent, uh, you know, advocate and thinker of all things directing. And I had some discussions with him like that in the States a little bit. Uh, I think we should have more, we should bring him up and we should, you know, we should have that as one of our industry networking days. How the hell do you become a, a director, you know? Yeah, I think it's a really good idea, Mark, yeah. Stuart. Uh, look, I just wanted to add, going back to the point about cultural tourism, you'll remember right at the very start uh, of the slideshow, of Brian's slideshow, that, um, that the Queensland Government has one of its uh, strategic targets, the doubling of, um, of, uh, of, of tourism, which includes cultural tourism. We, we saw a figure of $30 billion uh, target for overnight visitors by 2020. Uh, I think we've got, we could, we could really tap into that strategic object, longer term strategic objective and because it, research is needed into what motivates people to come to Queensland. The, the, the fact is we can assert all sorts of links and, and talk about anecdotes uh, from the past about, about neighbours and, you know, it's a, very, it's a really great story. Not from but, the past. Yeah, but, um, but what we need is contemporary research on the link between um, natural history and, and and fiction, like uh, long-form fiction, like um, the ones that have been exa uh, exampled. We need research on this. Uh, New Zealand has done fantastic research on the link between uh, the big uh, the big movies that have been made in, in New Zealand and tourism. It is, it is a very, very strong link, and it's been done with some fairly rigorous research. There's been very little of that done in Australia, uh, partly because of the complacency that Brian refers to, you know, it's such a lo lovely place, people take it for granted. Actually making the link and, 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 and creating research evidence-based links between um, audio, visual and, and tourism is a job that we should be really trying to lead and stimulate. We're probably still relying on the research we had with Paul Hogan about these movies too much. I, I do think that a lot of it's very out of date now. You know, I just mentioned we used to, um, Larry, on that point, it's such a strong point you made. I mean, we, we, the old days, I mean, I actually worked with Jenny at the time as well, we used to release some of our strongest video titles for South Through were, of course, natural history and Australian natural history. One of our biggest hits was Inside the Reef, which was made by QTQ and funded by Bond, you know, very wisely, I'm sure. Always a good investment there, and uh, it was a fantastic show, blue chip series, and it was it was a, a cracking hit on TV, and a cracking hit for is, us on video. And I think if there is any, um, you know, I, I think there's a real hope for the future, which would appeal to you, and that is that I have the absolute passionate conviction that this industry of ours is about to completely be transformed with IPTV and VOD, which is going to completely change the revenue model totally from advertiser driven to transactional pay-per-view. And it's just, it's, I think it's gonna be an absolute revenue bonanza. And one of the key areas that's gonna get the revenue is the areas you speak about for precisely the eyeball reasons that you argue. Yeah. Uh, I've, I'll put a proviso in that I don't set out to make a tourism film and I don't compromise the documentary. But hey, beautiful beaches, sunshine, kangaroos or whatever, they speak for themselves. I'm not. Yeah. Kind of not plum, uh, no, no. product placement. Uh, put a kangaroo in there quickly, just to no, <laughs> improve the tubes of meal. Quality uh, stories, character, and locations are not usually exclusive. It's the location yeah. that's yeah. selling yeah. itself. Uh, and I'm just repeating again, somebody's going to whisper to Tourism Queensland and the government and say, hey, you're spending fortunes for 30 second ads in America and uh, England and Germany, whatever the flavour of the month is, China. Uh, here's a, th a 60 minute ad. What are you going to do to help it? Exactly. Thanks. Lady behind you. Yeah. Great yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Melissa Hines. Just getting back to this idea of creating productions in Queensland. A number of the other film funding bodies in the States work with ABC and SBS and they create an initiative where there's like they want a program to suit a certain slot. And then the idea is that the producers then pitch ideas and then the successful idea goes into production. 
Is there any plans? I mean, Screen Queens I did this many years ago with down undergrads. Are there any plans for future projects like that? Issues? That's again, kind of an interesting idea, and I'm not entirely sure how those work, which is probably a gap in my knowledge. So you're saying that other state agencies, for example, have a specific deal with, say, ABA, ABC or SBS for a specific slot? Because I, I'd be a little... You go, sorry, please. How does, uh, that, how does that work, exactly? Well, there have been different initiatives. Yeah. Western Australia have done yeah. it. Film Vic have done it. Where I think Film Vic did one where it was children's TV. They were asking for children's concepts. And I think the idea is that ABC or SBS give money and then Screen Queensland give a certain amount of money. They develop the idea and then it goes into production. Oh. Okay, well, there's kind of a, a general answer to, to that point, which I think is a very, very strong point, and a kind of more specific one. The general answer is that one of the reasons SBS are, you know, are on the National Roadshow and we've invited them back is, is to foster, and Jenny is working on others, and may, I'll put it to her in a moment, uh, in one moment, but the, is to try and foster business models like that. And at a broader level, we are, for example, looking at strategic relationships with big international groups. Say, if we want to do children's, well, let's get a dialogue going with Nickelodeon or, um, uh, you know, uh, Cartoon Network or whatever, in, or Disney Kids Channel, because they are voracious consumers of content. So we as a government party, or, you know, can broker that, and they'll talk to us more easily because they know that we will, you know, behave in and, and, and help them uh, get into uh, credible producers in whatever region. So that's something strategically we are trying to foster and promote. But I think Jenny has something to say. Yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. We're scoping that at the moment. So and it's in particular in children's and looking to work with uh, broadcasters and that's just not just with the ABC or SBS. So it's extending it beyond there, and also looking at um, those facilitating those relationships and working strategic with alliances, especially in the Asian region. So that's happening right now. So we should have an update on that over the next uh, few months. Thank you. Um, World Animal Championships, which is being produced by Black Lab at the moment, it actually came out of one of those schemes. So it was a development program they did do with the various state agencies. Yeah. But that came from the commissioning editor coming to state agency saying, we want this type of program. Exactly. And so that's, it's yeah. developing that relationship. Yeah, that's, that's what we've been trying to facilitate now, which is, which is good. We've already started those conversations. As well. I think generally, though, the, you know, the ABC and SBS is have to kind of be pretty, again, agnostic. They have to go to all the states. They can't single out a particular state. So, you know, like all government bodies, you're always mindful of you know, offering the opportunity to everybody and not showing favoritism, you know. They're, that's they're something. induced yeah. by the state. The state induces okay. them. Okay, point taken, Larry. So if it's, inst yeah, and that's why we're trying to turn it around in that way. Yeah, point taken. Yeah. Folks, the witching hour is upon us, so I'm going to take the last two questions, which is one over here, and finish up with Kira. John Cheney, I work in the, as a lawyer in the music industry. We have a very vibrant music industry in Queensland, and especially in Brisbane. Uh, has uh, Screen Queensland thought about sourcing any of their music for these wonderful productions from the local scene? Well, I, 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 I take your point. Um, I think that's probably not in our domain, it's more in the producer's domain. Uh, you know, uh, to, it's really, uh, like any provider to a production, it's really about uh, pitching that to you know, producers and, uh, uh, and with getting... With Big Sound coming up um, again this year, I think it would yeah. be great if we could organise um, some sort of, um, you know, joint um, yeah, yeah. Uh, event, um, and like we do with the Writers' Festival as well, and I think, you know, definitely um, producers, um, you know, we've, we've, we are looking to how yeah. we can use more yeah. local composers and, and schools, yeah. and I know we do and John, to some that's... extent, but we'd, we'd like to improve that. Thanks, Trish. And John, that, that, that also, as Trish is speaking, it struck me that music could be another uh, one of our networking events that we could specifically organise. So, a lot going on, a lot of new ideas, but that, that would appear to be a logical Also, inclusion. just to add to that, we do, just don't forget about BIF either. We've got some really good music strands in there, and I'm working with, because of my background, with, the, with some of the music companies in Sydney that also have uh, musicians here. So, we're trying to always bring a Queensland element into everything that we're doing. So it's really important. So even at um, BIF at the moment, that's exactly what we're trying to do. So, and even to, you know, when we have the opening party and that, to have an element of that in there as well. So, and we are negotiating for a particular film which has a big uh, 
big music element. Great. Thank you. But John, remind us of that idea if we do forget, because I think it's a really mm. cracking idea and, yeah. and something you're right to identify, a bit of a gap. And Stuart, would we be in the mind if we mentioned Quentin Library and the wonderful music program that we're having at the The bands? Go right ahead. Should I have or not? Jerry. Just a quick comment on uh, that previous question, and that is that uh, through the Screen Development Centres nationally, and Jenny knows it's only too well because she helped trigger the process, which has just been agreed to. So ABC2 uh, doing a program with us at a national level um, under the Raw Nerve program called Worst Date, Best Date, Best Date, Worst Date. A sort of a rom-com ultra short drama series for ABC2 based on an interstitial model. Um, I'm, I'm, with all this reimagining and redesigning, I'm just wondering where uh, Screen Queensland see the Screen Development Centre standing. Well, I think we, you know, as I say, we're, we're looking at the whole issue of professional development and career pathways that obviously bears directly on screen development. So, um, you know, that conversation, discussion, reviews ongoing. Yeah, so um, I, we, we, our, our sole agenda, as you know, Kerry, is just to try and deliver the best possible outcome for Queens and screen practitioners. So. Um, that's what we're, you know, reviewing internally and with yourselves at the moment, and uh, that'll continue. Yeah. So we could continue to do that during this consultation period before things get fixed. Most well, um, yeah, that will be happening <coughs> in the next, uh, you know, few Fantastic. weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Great. We've been obviously, uh, we we certainly Jenny, myself, and one or two others have been a little bit buried and immersed in this because obviously uh, there's always a process with any, uh, you know, change of guard, changing of the guard at all these levels uh, and looking at everything that we do and there's always a natural human desire we're all impatient and and want to crack on so it's been you know we've had to get across a lot of different stuff and uh got to be at the same time quite calm about uh not throwing the baby out of the bathwater and kind of knee jerking into too much change so it's a bit of a balanced judgment but look you give us your ideas uh, after this, uh, both now at the drinks and uh, by email. We, we welcome that. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks, well, folks. On behalf of the board, I want to first thank uh, Brian and his management team for the uh, huge amount of work they've put into um, developing uh, you know, our vision and, and what we want to uh, do to achieve that, what we need to do to achieve that. Uh, but secondly, and perhaps most importantly, I want to thank all of you for participating in this forum today, uh, sharing your ideas with us. Uh, as Brian mentioned, this isn't the end of the process today. Uh, I think over the course of the month, we'll be taking uh, submissions from you. If uh, you go away and want to reflect on something that someone said and, and contribute an idea or a, or a comment, please do so. Brian, the date for that was 24th of May? 24, Friday 24 May. So, uh, so you've got yeah. until the 24th of May. Yeah. I encourage you to do that. Um, and then we hope to have it all finalised and uh, delivered to the Minister on the 26th for publication on the 28th of June. So uh, watch the space. <laughs>